Session 1, Prehistory, 11,000 to 7,000 years ago. Before history began, there was love. It was expressed in art in the form of small stone carvings, such as this one from the Ain Akri Caves near modern Bethlehem, depicting two lovers in mid-coital embrace resembling the shape of a human heart muscle, dating from 11,000 years ago. The human who carved this artifact lived in the Levant, or Fertile Crescent, region among a tribe of up to a hundred people, who archaeologists call the Natufians. They settled the lands of the Kebaran cave dwellers, their ancestors, who had moved from the upland steppes in summer to the lower lakeside caves in winter from 20,000 to 12,000 years ago. The Natufians invented the sickle for harvesting wild grains and were the first people to domesticate the growing of figs, which they imported from the area of Sudan in northeastern Africa, south of the Nile, across the Red Sea from the Sinai Peninsula. The records of civilization as we define it today can be dated only so long ago as the semi-sedentary dwelling place Ainan Malaha by Lake Hula, founded around 12,000 years ago. Here has been found the earliest evidence of animal domestication, the burial of a person with a pet dog. 11,500 years ago, the Natufian tribes people spread to the east and settled at Abu Haraya Mound, near the south bank of the Euphrates River. Here, about 300 people dwelt in round brush huts with holes in the floor for storing food to keep it cool. The Natufians soon expanded to the foothills of the Taurus Mountains, where they built square stone houses at Neval Khori on both banks of the Cantara Stream, a tributary of the Euphrates. Here they settled, and nearby at Gobitli Tape, Turkish for Potbelly Hill, they erected the first megalithic structures. Although the purpose of these strange T-shaped stone pillars surrounded by circular stone walls remains a mystery to modern archaeologists due to the many carvings on their surfaces of animals, including the scorpion and birds seen here, it may be they were built as large storehouses for the cultivation of cereal grains such as rye, which have been found dating from around 11,050 years ago at Abu Haraya Mound. 10,500 years ago, the Natufian people built the city of Jericho, six acres of round mud brick houses, housing some two to three thousand people. 10,000 years ago, they built a wall 5 feet thick and 15 feet tall surrounding the city, with a lone lookout tower nearly 30 feet tall. Around that time, the settlement of Abu Horea seems to have been abandoned, with the Natufians of the foothills moving northwest behind the fortified wall of the Jericho proto-city, or to nearby Asikli Hayuk, founded around 10,000 years ago on volcanic turf near Melinda's Brook. The first evidence of making beads for use as jewelry dates from this time at a Asikli Mound using azurite, amber, jade, and bone. 9,500 years ago, the Natufians built up Katel Hayuk, Turkish for Fork Mound, on twin alluvial clay mounds. 
the eastern of which rises 66 feet above the Konya Plains wheat field. With the Karsamba River flowing between them from the twin coned Hassan Dag volcano, some 87 miles to the northwest. 9,300 years ago, settlers moved back into Abu Harea, and by this time were herding animals and sun baking molded mud to form the world's first pottery. 9,250 years ago, the Natufians constructed Ein Ghazal, a complex of up to 3,000 rectangular, two-room, lime-plastered mud wall houses stretching across 30 acres, some four or five times the size of contemporary Jericho. At Ein Ghazal, the people herded domesticated goats, wove hair fibers into fabrics, and cultivated a wide variety of cereals, including wheat and barley, and legumes, beans, peas, and lentils. The Natufians of Ein Ghazal were also the first to make face masks and one-half life-size dolls from painted white plaster, using cowrie shells for eyes. Some of the dolls have a limbless rectangular torso and two heads. At Ein Ghazal, the Natufians buried their dead in two ways. One was preservation of the deceased's severed head in a grave beneath their family house. The other was disposal of the body in the communal waste pits. From 8,100 to 7,500 years ago, the Natufians became the Halaf and Hasuna painted pottery cultures. Inventors of the wheel, pressed leaf paper, and the engraved cylinder seal. Katul Hayuk remained continuously populated until 7,700 years ago. Abu Hayriya and Ein Ghazal were abandoned 7,000 years ago. From 7,500 to 6,800 years ago, the Neolithic Halaf and Hasuna cultures became the Caltholithic Samaran culture. They migrated southeast and settled in Choga, Mami, Tel Sawan, and Sur Marathi on the alluvial clay plain between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers near the northern shore of the Persian Gulf. They built massive canal systems to irrigate vast tracts of crops, and from 6,800 years ago had invented metal sickle blades, the horse-drawn chariot, and sailboats. By 5,400 years ago, the cuneiform alphabet had evolved into the use of clay tokens as money, and by 5,000 years ago, Cities were built covering up to 250 acres to house as many as 20,000 people. Session 2. Sumerian Civilization. 7,000 to 6,000 years ago. Part 1. The Sumerians. Here we can see how the Sumerians depicted themselves. This collection of varying sized dolls shows shirtless, bearded men with long hair and women with bobbed or bunned hair wearing togas. All hold their hands together before their hearts in the supplicant gesture. This bust of an Adamu worker shows the typical facial features of a Sumerian youth. The lips are thin, the eyes large and almond-shaped, usually made of cowrie shells, and the forehead is marked by the distinctive unibrow of Sumerian art. Here we see a small diorite statue of Gudea of Lagash from 4,130 years ago. Note his bare feet, his round, bearded crown, and his seated supplicant position. The inscription on his robe is in cuneiform, the alphabetic language of Sumer. 
Here we see the legal code of Hammurabi, written 3,760 years ago in the alphabetic language of cuneiform. In this incredible alphabetic language, we find long texts engraved on clay, such as this one, describing observations of the passing of Halley's Comet. In this fragmented relic, we see an ancient Sumerian map of the globe. From this era dates the writing of the first work of novel fiction and predecessor to the Torah. In this cylinder seal, we see a scene from the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh and Enkidu kill Humbaba. Next, we see another depiction showing the same event engraven on stone. Also engraven on stone is this tablet containing a portion of the 4,500-year-old story describing an ancient worldwide flood that occurred before the beginning of recorded history. Session 2. Sumerian Civilization. 7,000 to 6,000 years ago. Part 2. The God, Shamash Utu. Prior to the events described in the biblical book of Exodus, one language was spoken, and the global deluge had not yet occurred. One religion spanned the entirety of all existing civilizations, from the Vedic Aryans in India, China, and Tibet, to the Sumero-Akkadians in pre-Babylonian Mesopotamia, to the Old Kingdom Hyksos and Ethiopian Egyptians along the African Nile River. The winged disc originally symbolized a concept similar to the modern Holy Trinity. It depicts the divine goddess as the central vesica, womb, Pisces, fish, while the divine messiah is expressed as emanating from within in the form of the twin wings symbolizing the flight of time or serpents symbolizing time's shifting sands. In this image from modern day Zoroastrianism, the good god called Uhuru Mazda mounts the winged disc called a Faravarhar, alike the Vimana of the Veda, to complete the trinity of God, Goddess, and Messiah. This symbol of modern Zoroastrian religion dates back to the earliest written records of history, many millennia before the first writing of the Torah by Moses. The symbol of God inside a winged, flying, disc-shaped craft, his Faravarhar Vimana, dates back to the earliest city-states of Mesopotamia. This relic depicts the same image from the era of the Akkadian Empire some 3,000 years ago, though they called this god not Ahura Mazda then, but Ashur. This symbol appears even earlier in this Chaldean cylinder seal imprint. Here we see the god in his flying vessel floating above a crescent moon, symbolizing the spring equinox in the contemporary vocabulary. On the far right stands a man gesturing at the god, to his left stands a shorter man, clad in the garb of a fish. Between these two, directly below the crescent eclipse, stands an arched doorway surrounded by seventeen flames. Behind the myrrh priest is a creature called Tiamat, a snake with wings and legs. Above Tiamat shines a sixteen-point star, to the right of which appear seven orbs. Here is a similar depiction also from Chaldea prior to the Akkadian occupation. Here again the seventeen flames surrounding the arched gate, the fish-clad priest, and the god in his Farvarhar aircraft are all meticulously copied. The Chaldean examples show the fish-clad priest character quite clearly. However, his exact function in their society has since been lost. That he is a human male holding a small sphere and wearing on his own head the face-up, mouth-agape skin of a large fish is quite clear from the depictions. In this carved stone bust of one of these mermen from the Sumerian collection in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, 
we see the shape of their crown makes their heads appear elongated, but that their facial features remain distinctly human in all traits. Likewise, we see another example of the elongated skull in this small doll, also from the Uruk period, 7,000 years ago. This one-third scale doll possesses a different set of facial traits than those shown in the larger-than-life scale bust. This small doll has large almond-shaped black eyes and a small, narrow-lipped mouth. Obviously, however, both bust and doll depict males, since the doll has anatomically accurate male genitalia. In one of the oldest cylinder seal impressions unearthed from the Uruk period, we can see a clear depiction of the same Mer priest character on the far right, holding a six-rayed orb up in his hand. In the middle, we see the Faravarhar Vimana, the winged disc, above a small triangular platform. In turn, above a large fish or dolphin. On the far left appears the god, dethroned from his sky chariot, manifesting his four-armed form, each arm symbolizing a seasonal element. He holds below a cup and downward-pointed sword, and above seven orbs and a crescent. One of the next earliest known cylinder seals impresses this depiction of the god, now seated on a cubic throne, counseling with a second figure who appears to have two faces. Beside this figure stands a staff atop of which are six rays. Following this, we see this post-Akkadian era impression from a cylinder seal labeled with cuneiform writing. Here we see the god, identified by his turban-shaped crown, remains seated on his cubic throne, while before him two men appear, the one closer to the god seemingly dragging the other one by his wrist. Behind and above the two men is a six-rayed orb surrounded by eleven smaller orbs. In this Chaldean version of the motif, we see the god on the far right seated on his cubic throne, holding the symbols of kingship, the loop and the line, in his right hand, behind a brick pillar. Inside the god's partition are three orbs, one with seven rays, one with eight rays, and one a crescent. Outside the god's partition stand three very short people relative in size to the stature of the god. The first appears to be dragging the second by the wrist again, and the third and last in the lower left appears to be a female. Between the partition occluding the god and the three small people looking up at him, we see a symbol of Tiamat as an orb of four rays and four rivers, set atop a platform that dwarfs the people by its size. Here, in an early Akkadian period cylinder seal, we see the god again seated on his cubic throne, with his now familiar beard and twin flowing river symbols signifying autumn equinox around him. His sometimes turban-like crown appears like horns, on the same level as the crescent, again a sign of springtime in Sumerian culture. Just below this crescent is a star of eight stellations. Three small fish are jumping upstream along one of the god's river symbols, and three people the same height standing up as the god is sitting down, surrounded the god on both sides. On opposite sides of the god, the two males who wear beards grasp downward-pointing spears with hourglass-like shapes atop their upside-down base ends. The two men appear to be holding open the partition between them and the god, while the woman on the far left looks in on him. This highly stylized, late Akkadian period cylinder seal impression commemorates the coronation of Judea over Lagash and shows the same scene as before wherein the god is seated on the far right on a cubic throne, surrounded by autumnal river symbols. The three people are, again, the man holding the other man by the wrist, both followed by the female supplicant, seen here wearing a crescent horn crown. 
The man dragged by the other man is bald and wears a mild toga, while the man dragging him toward the god is bearded and wears an identical crown to the god. In this depiction, the god is shown passing over from his hands unto the crowned man a small vase containing a plant. Behind the woman's back on the far left creeps Tiamat, the winged, four-legged serpent. Session 2. Sumerian Civilization. 7,000 to 6,000 years ago. Part 3. The Devil. Tiamat. As we have briefly examined the crescent orb symbol of spring equinox, the fish man symbol of winter solstice, and the river symbols of autumnal equinox, we should also examine the symbolism of Tiamat. Tiamat's earliest depictions are as upright walking, four-legged snakes with wings, frequently seen wearing crowns. Here we see twin Tiamats of this form holding twin corsair swords by the blades towards a single serpent coiled around itself in six loops with a head at both ends of its body. Just as the male doll from the earliest Uruk period depicted the same elongated head motif as the fish priests of Chaldea, so too does the female counterpart of that doll exhibit very similar facial features to a reptile, such as a serpent. She holds a small baby to her breast, and the baby appears to have horns. The reptilian motif has long been a symbol for Tiamat. In this Uruk period carving of a life-scale mask, we find the same reptilian features as the serpent symbolizing Tiamat. Just as Tiamat, symbolized by the winged, four-legged dragons encaging the twin-headed serpent, guards the tree of life, so are their guardians over the tree of knowledge. While the tree of life was symbolized by the twin-headed serpent, the tree of knowledge is a complex geometrical arrangement of thirteen blossoms on a vine lattice around a central blooming trunk. While the guardians of the fifteen flamed arched doorway were the fish-robed men symbolizing winter, the guardians of the thirteen blossoming tree of knowledge are garbed as birds with the head of the phoenix and two wings. They water the tree of knowledge and pick the blossoms from it, and just as the dragons ensnaring the double-headed snake of the tree of life, these anthropomorphized avians also represent Tiamat. To return to the doings of the god while he sat on his cubic throne and was not riding the sky in his Faravarhar Vimana, when we finally see him equaled in stature, it comes from this low relief from Lagash. On one side sits the god, offering in his outstretched right hand the ring and the rod symbolizing kingship. On the opposite side sits a goddess, wearing the same form of turban crown as the god, reaching out to receive the offering with her left hand. Between them grows a single enormous potted leaf. Note that the god holds back his scepter flail. Next, we see another extremely ancient cylinder seal imprint, dating from six to 7,000 years ago. We see on the far right a tree with eight branches, each with one leaf. To the left of this tree sits the goddess on her cubic throne, wearing a crown of crescent horns. She holds in her lap a young child with a single long forelock of hair. Below the child at the goddess's feet is a pit dug in the ground. On the opposite side of this pit from the goddess stands a man with short hair and no beard offering up a cup. Behind this man on the far left is another man kneeling down to adjust the lid atop a canister that sits on a short tripod platform. Above this is a shelf with three narrow vases on it. In this mid to late Akkadian cylinder seal, we see all these elements depicted in one scene. On the outermost flanks are the twin, bird-headed and winged men representing Tiamat. They apply their blossoms to the fish priests, who in turn apply the river symbols from the god above to a fifteen-stemmed, newly budding tree. Above, in the center, 
we see again the god in his Faravarhar Vimana now facing the opposite direction he was when he arrived to be greeted by the fish priests. Here is a later post-Babylonian cylinder seal inscription showing four epic heroes, each alike Gilgamesh in facial appearance, kneeling to hold up standards bearing the symbols of the four seasons. On the left we see the orb form of Tiamat symbolizing summer, the water symbol representing autumn, the fish man symbolizing winter, and the crescent symbol representing the return once again to spring. A rising serpent marks the end and restart date per annum. As we shall see, the use of animalistic symbols to signify the four elemental seasons was a precursor to the Babylonian Dendara zodiacs as well as Egyptian and Mesoamerican hieroglyphics and began a trend that has not stopped since. Here we see the Ishtar Gate of Babylon erected 2,575 years ago. It is decorated with low reliefs of bulls signifying summer, lions with their tails up or down representing spring and autumn, and representing winter, we come back again to Tiamat. In this image from a Sumerian cylinder seal, at least some 5,000 years old, we see the god standing upright on the left, identified by his beard. He displays the gesture of supplication toward Tiamat, depicted as a four-legged serpent. On Tiamat's back is a platform or saddle, in the middle of which stands an erect pillar or column, at the top of which is a triangle pointing upward. The combined height of Tiamat and this pillar is equal to the height of the upright standing god. From a pre-Babylonian cylinder seal, we imprint this image, showing the god on the left, identified by his beard and turban crown, drawing back a bowstring to shoot an arrow toward a winged Tiamat, who appears on the right, rearing back on its hind legs. The image of Tiamat resembles a combination of the four-legged serpent, lion, and bull motifs. Between the god and Tiamat, above the trajectory of the arrow, sits the winged disc motif of Ahura Mazda's Faravarhar. Beneath this, between the god and Tiamat, is a crowned and bearded supplicant, surrounded in a sphere offering three small orbs toward the god. The battle between the god and Tiamat is further depicted in this low-relief cylinder seal from the Akkadian Empire era. The god in the upper left shoots his arrow toward Tiamat, seen in mid-retreat, aimed directly at Tiamat's head. Again, we see Tiamat as an exospecies of zoomorph, resembling a combination of avian and reptilian characteristics, with feet and wings like a bird, and the torso and head of a snake. Behind Tiamat's turned head, in the direction of its body's retreat, we see a seven-rayed orb above, and below an eleven-petaled arc. Beneath the feet of the god crouches a griffin, that is, a winged lion, which may depict the god's Faravarhar from the side. In this low-relief carving from the era of the first Babylonian Empire, Tiamat appears again on the retreat from the god, however here their positions are reversed from left to right. Tiamat, on the left, looks over its winged shoulder at the god, on the right, who is chasing after Tiamat, carrying a bundle of three arrows in each hand. Tiamat appears as a combinatory zoomorph again, with the head of a bull, the neck of a snake, the front paws and torso of a lion, the back legs and two wings of a bird. The god appears with one foot off the ground, his customary beard and crown, and four wings. Here we see Tiamat as a combinatory zoomorph, again from the Babylonian wall carving. Note the manneristic attention paid to the thumbs on its front paws. The nails or claws on them are crooked. Here we can more clearly see Tiamat has the horns of a bull, the belly of a snake, and the back of a bird. 
Its snarling face appears in great detail with an emphasis on its bat-like nostrils and fangs. This statuette from the Akkadian Empire period shows a character very similar to Tiamat. This mixed zoomorph has the legs of a ram or goat, male genitalia, the paws of a lion, four wings, and the hairless head of a snarling lion. This statuette represents Pazuzu, the demi-god of the southwest wind. There are similar miniature busts from this era that show Pazuzu in greater detail, with three concentric circles for eyes, an upturned nose like a pig, shallow cheeks, and a menacing set of fangs. Other zoomorphs include lion-headed upper torso busts with the neck and front legs of a dragon. As we see in this circular arrangement of glyphs from Babylonian Chaldea, the zoomorphs cataloged by the people of this era included an array of familiar animals alongside representations of combined trait beasts. We see in this zodiac a snake, a bird, a turtle, two beehives, a dog, and a scorpion. We see also three orbs, from left to right a crescent, a four-point star emanating four wave symbols, and an eight-point star. We see also two griffiths. All of these catalog symbols of Tiamat. Session 2 South American Civilization 10,240 to 5,114 years ago. Just as from the Middle East, the Hebrew Bible records the story of creation of the cosmos, the creation of humans, and so forth in Genesis, so too does the Popol Vuh, the South and Mesoamerican equivalent literary collection of mythology. We can enter historical records of civilization in this region at approximately the same time as we can see earliest civilizations begin in the Middle East as well, some 10,500 to 7,000 years before now. However, besides the myths describing the historical archetypal characters in the narrative storyline intertwining the various epoch events, from the period prior to the earliest recorded history when the Popol Vuh was first written down, we have many fossil and stone artifacts describing several distinct cultural phases in the civilization of the South American continent. The Popol Vuh record begins after the World Flood, in the modern era, but before that, besides the relics that remain, the Popol Vuh's content is merely conjecture. We begin with the earliest known signs of civilization in South America, in the modern nation of Peru. Here we see, from a distance of several hundred feet above the ground, one of the massive Nazca lines, designed by assorting colored pebbles that stretch for hundreds of miles across the dry, windless desert. Some of these monumental geoglyphs take on configurations of unilinear illustrations in the style of primitive petroglyphs, like a zodiac of pre-alphabetic hieroglyphics. This single consecutive outline of a figure seems to show a monkey with a tail that becomes a spiromabulus several hundred feet in diameter. Again, seen from a height of several miles above ground, we can look down at this vast geoglyph traced in the desert stones, a unilinear silhouette of two hands, one with five fingers, the other with only four. Hundreds of these types of geoglyphs are etched into the sand across hundreds of miles of the Nazca Plain. They depict all sorts of animal shapes as well as some rudimentary geometric figures, such as the line, the spiral, etc. Little is known about the people who carved these lines, or even when they were originally constructed. However, the remains of terracotta pot shards from the nearby area tell us some about the culture of the people who were, at the least, the Nazca Line's latest custodians. Here we see a vase shaped like a mushroom, painted with lizards, a regular bowl with geometric fish designs, a dual stem vase with figurative birds, and a primitive pipe sculpted to look like a snake. 
the remains of the people themselves are preserved to this day by a process of desiccating and mummification performed on them at the time of their decease. The mummy we see here wears a patterned beaded headband over long, straight red hair. In the jungles of Peru to the northeast of the Nazca Desert, we find a strange collection of artifacts in the form of carvings on stone many modern archaeologists refuse to accept as authentic relics due to the impossibility of accurately dating their crafting and due to the fact that they can be replicated using modern tools such as the Dremel. Regardless of their authenticity, however, the Ica stones are further shocking in the content of their art. As we can see in these few examples from among the hundreds thus far found in this area, they depict such absolute anachronisms it boggles the scientific mind. A man rides a pterodactyl flying dinosaur. A map of the globe showing South America connecting to Australia between Antarctica and South Africa. An artificial breathing apparatus for keeping a patient alive while performing open torso surgery. An anatomically accurate triceratops quadruped dinosaur. Another map of the globe showing land masses surrounded by their suboceanic tectonic plates. A second example of two surgeons performing an open torso inspection. A man with a telescope looking up at a comet. However, even more difficult to explain than the anachronistic Ica stones are the elongated human skulls found throughout South and Mesoamerica, occurring in their highest abundance in the area around Ica in the jungles of Peru. Because there is no evidence in most of these of trephination, the surgical removal of a portion of the skull bones when young that expands the size of the cranial cavity with age, it is still widely believed by anthropologists this deformation was accomplished by tightly tying short wooden boards around the skull from a young age. The cultural purpose of this practice has since been lost to time. The first massively built structure in South America, so far as is known now, is at Tiwanaku in Peru. Here we see the three stelae at the center of the wide courtyard of the Temple of Viracocha at Tiwanaku. Placed facing the entrance to this slightly subterranean courtyard is the stelae of Viracocha. At some distance behind this stelae is an archway that was not apparently attached to any other structure. This is the gateway of Viracocha. Here we see the carving of him above the gateway, signifying him as a feathered serpent. The next sign of prehistoric civilization in South America is the High Andes Mountain Pass Incan city of Machu Picchu in Peru, displaying an advanced level of both architecture and its stepped ar agricultural terraces and its stone masonry in hewing, transporting, and fitting the stones of the city's walls, some of which weigh as much as 10 tons, the same size as the blocks comprising the Great Pyramid at Giza. Machu Picchu was built some 600 years ago, only shortly before the Spanish-European invasion of South America. However, it represents the Incan civilization indigenous to this area from before the origins of recorded history can account. Session 2B Mesoamerican Civilization 5,114 years ago to 2012 year Pythagoras Before we can bring the context of Mesoamerican civilizations up to contemporary dates with the later Incan Empire in South America, we must first consider the Olmecs, who were late contemporaries of the Nazcans and Icans of Peru. The Olmecs once populated the entire Mesoamerican land bridge and the Yucatan Peninsula. However, by the time recorded history began being kept by the Maya in the form of the Popol Vuh, the earliest surviving written record in the area, the Olmec were already mostly forgotten. 
their populations dispersed in the south-central jungles of what we today call Mexico. From 3,600 to 2,400 years ago, the Olmec lived in dense populations in a rigid class structure. Their artifacts and relics remaining to this day include, most recognizably, several hundred enormous stone busts scattered throughout the jungle of Mesoamerica. The scale of all of them is identical, though no two look exactly alike. Some depict wrinkled old women, others robust masculine bone structure, but few resemble the appearance of the indigenous people populating the region today. The first great civilization to arise following the downfall of the Olmec society were the Mayans of the Yucatan Peninsula. It was the Mayans, some 4,600 years before now, who codified their hieroglyphic alphabet of ideograms and began keeping the written record that has come down to us today in the form of only a few codices in Mayan script and the Spanish Popol Vuh. In this illustration from one of the surviving codices, we can see one of the main characters from the story's narrative using a blowgun to hunt the Quetzal bird. Below the bird is a vision serpent, identifying again with the archetype of the feathered serpent. From earliest Mayan architecture, we find monumental-sized sets built for the staging of dramatic events meant to act out and commemorate the events in the stories of the Popol Vuh's narrative. At Copan, we find the sacred ball court of the Zibalba Bay. It was here the lords of the Mayan underworld entered into the earth down a stairway from the sky. Likewise, at nearby Tikal, the ruins attest to the bold egos of the chiefs who ruled in the names of these Mayan underworld lords. The palaces of the ball court players stand monumentally tall and date as far back as 2,500 years ago. Nearly equidistant from Tikal, as Tikal was from Copan, lay the Mayan observatory temples of Palenque. It is here, in the Temple of Inscriptions, we find the tomb of Pakal Votan, who reigned around 1300 years ago. On the intricate low relief of the lid of the, his sarcophagus, we see Pakal seated above the demonic bat deity Zots, inhaling ayahuasca from the tree of the crossroads, atop which sits the Quetzal. Around 1,010 years ago, the Temple of Quetzalcoatl was erected by the Toltec king of that name at the site of a well long used for human sacrifice. This signified the height of, and the beginning of the eventual decline of, the Mayan culture of the region. The Mayan culture was complex, and its pantheon of deities were illustratively detailed anthropomorphic zoomorphs who controlled various elementary forces on earth such as the bat god, the god of rain, the god of death, etc. Their calendrical method was capable of measuring extraordinarily long durations of time such that their calculations could easily exceed not only the age of the planet earth but the galaxy and possibly even the currently known cosmos itself. This system, while elaborate in appearance and application, is simple in its basic component units. A day is called a kin. A weenal, the Mayan month, is 20 kin. A ton is the Mayan solar year of 360 kin. A katun is the square of a ton. A bakton, the square of the katun, and so forth on unendingly. Each weenal in a ton has its own glyph name, and each kin in a weenal has its own unique glyph name. Thus, there are 18 weenals in a ton, with an extra seven Zamakaba Kim days, or unlucky Kim. The method of calculating any given day's relation to any other day, regardless of how far apart they may be on a calendar, was thus a simple string of numbers of which kin, of which weenal, of which ton, of which katun, of which bakton, and so on unendingly. The 19 Mayan months in a solar year work as a cogged gear 
in this calendar system's machinery. The 13 days of a Mayan week, the 20 days of the Mayan month, the 19 months of the Mayan year, and so forth, all combine to form the overall Mayan calendrical model. The less sophisticated, though more popularly understood, calendrical model that followed immediately from the decline and fall of the Mayan culture was Aztec. The Aztec calendar stone depicts the 20 days of the month around the four seasonal epochs, with the face of Tezcatlipoca standing for the fifth sun in the center. While highly symbolic, this arrangement does not function as a calendrical mechanism. 675 years ago, the Aztecs established the Triple Alliance between the cities of Tenochtitlan, Teotihuacan, and Tlacopan by settling on Lake Taxcaco and founding what has since become Mexico City. The pyramids of the sun and moon and the temple of Quetzalcoatl along the Avenue of the Dead in Teotihuacan are constructed to align with three stars in the constellation we call now Orion. The Great Pyramids in Giza, Egypt, built some 3,885 years before, are likewise aligned. Session 3, Before the Deluge, 11,000 to 6,000 years ago. Part 1, Prehistory. Following the Kebaran cave dwellers, the semi-sedentary Neolithic Natufians invented agriculture, the wheel, jewelry, and sculpture. However, between the end of the Natufian culture in the Levant and the beginning of the earliest city-states in Sumer, there occurred a massive flood that deposited ten feet of silt over the earliest cities of the Fertile Crescent. Following this, Sumerian culture arose, as if fully formed, in possession of a written alphabet, a token exchange economy, and a social class structure. The post-Sumero-Akkadian Babylonian Kings list describes the eight kings who reigned in five cities prior to the flood thus. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Iridu. In Iridu, Alalim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Alalgar ruled for 36,000 years. Two kings, they ruled for 64,800 years. Then Iridu fell, and the kingship was taken to Bad Tibira. In Bad Tibira, Enmen Luana ruled for 43,200 years. Enmen Galana ruled for 28,800 years. Dumuzi the shepherd ruled for 36,000 years. Three kings, they ruled for 108,000 years. Then Bad Tibira fell and the kingship was taken to Larag. In Larag, Ensipid Zidana ruled for 28,800 years. One king, he ruled for 28,800 years. Then Larag fell, and the kingship was taken to Zimbir. In Zimbir, Enmendurana became king. He ruled for 21,000 years. One king, he ruled for 21,000 years. Then Zimbir fell, and the kingship was taken to Shuropak. In Shuropak, Ubaro Tutu became king. He ruled for 18,600 years. One king. He ruled for 18,600 years. In five cities, eight kings. They ruled for 241,200 years. Then the flood swept over. As we have seen, the most likely candidates for these five proto-cities are 1. Iridu, the area of Ain Akri, Ain in Malaha, and Abu Harea in the Levant. 2. Bad Tibira, the area of Nevelkore and Gobikli Tape 
in northern Mesopotamia, three, Larach, the area of Jericho and Asikli Hayuk between the Levant and Mesopotamia, four, Sipur, Katul Hayuk in northern Mesopotamia, five, Shurapak, near Ein Gazal between the Levant and Mesopotamia. As I will seek to demonstrate in this lecture, these five Neolithic sites in the Levant region correlate to the towns in the Babylonian kings list because the eight given names of the priest kings who ruled in each also correspond to certain of the pantheon of city-state deities in Sumerian culture. Thus, the kings of ancient villages became deified into gods by the empires that arose after the flood. Session 3a. The Anunnaki and Nephilim in Sumerian myth from prehistory to 4,000 years ago. Before the first written Torah, there was the vocal tradition of biblical myths, which in turn evolved from the original version of a biblical text composed some 8,000 years ago in Sumer. At that time, the lands of Mesopotamia were not a desert as they are now, but were lush and fertile, fecund with flora and fauna. The Sumerians codified the first collection of religious myths, which preserved explanations from prehistoric times for how the world of that time had come to be. For example, this proto-Bible described the reason the Fertile Crescent dried up into a desert as due to a nuclear war between the Pantheon that occurred in the region at the end of the Sumero-Akkadian Empire and the beginning of unified Babylon. This work describes aeons of prehistory in much more vivid detail than the Babylonian King's List's simplified format. According to the Sumerian Bible, the so-called Book of Enki, the priest kings of the prehistoric Neolithic settlements were actually extraterrestrial biological entities from a distant brown dwarf sister star to our own sun. They lived on a planet the Sumerians called Nibiru, but by the time of the writing of the Babylonian version of Genesis, the Enuma Elish, the name Nibiru was replaced by the empire's patron deity's name, Marduk. According to the Sumerian Bible of Enki, there were a long line of kings who reigned on the planet Nibiru prior to their discovery of life on our planet, Earth. Finally, it was King Anu, in pursuit of the criminal Alalu, who landed here and saw the potential for interplanetary cultivation by his alien species. Beginning from the earliest carvings in the late Paleolithic, such as the heart-shaped lovers of Ein Akri and the Ein Gazal double-headed dolls, we see the motif of the cross-breeding between early hominids and alien gods being portrayed according to the Sumerian interpretation. The earliest Sumerian artifacts show these EBEs in vivid detail. They portray them as the prototypical male and female precursor of Adam and Eve from Genesis. The male has an elongated skull and enlarged, empty, black, almond-shaped eyes. The female has reptilian facial features and nurses a child almost resembling a humanoid dinosaur. The Sumerian Book of Enki tells of how the children of King Anu, Prince Enki, Prince Enlil, and Princess Ninlil, came to Earth and cultivated the early hominid species into the form of the Natufian Neolithic culture. It calls this royal family the Anunnaki, meaning the Watchers, the original pantheon of Sumer. Those offspring of this royal lineage that were born not on Nibiru but on Earth were called the Nephilim. While the facial features and bone structure of the original Anunnaki from Nibiru appear entirely alien. The Nephilim appear as giant humanoids with elongated skulls. It is from the era of rulership by the Anunnaki we credit the discovery of agriculture and art. 
However, it is from the era of reign by the Nephilim that we trace the origins of writing and the arts. The myths describing the origins of agriculture and animal domestication as gifts from the gods date to the era of the Nephilim rulers, the aliens who were born on earth. Thus, it is from among the Nephilim generations we find five of the eight pre-diluvial rulers from the Babylonian kings list, following in generations from the original three Anunnaki who ruled earth. These three original gods established their kingdoms in three regions. To Enlil, the eldest, went the realm of the Tigris and Euphrates River. To Enki, the younger prince, went the realm of the Egyptian Nile River. To Nenlil, the princess and goddess, went the realm of the Indus and Ganges rivers in the Orient. Of course, by the time of the drying out into a desert of the Fertile Crescent, following the great flood of the Mesopotamian region, the three great civilizations had long since developed their own unique cultures, class structures, and metaphysics. By the time the terrestrial Nephilim ruled these regions, Inanna, the granddaughter of Ninlil, ruled the Vedic Aryans, the later Indo-Europeans, in the Orient, Ningish Zitta, the elder son of Enki, ruled Egypt, and the Babylonian patron deity, the younger son of Enki, Marduk, was the god over the culture of Babylon. It was Marduk who would later become Ashar, and in modern times is called Uhuru Mazda, the father of Zoroaster, and the god of Zoroastrianism. It was said that Following the nuclear war between the Nephilim that left the Fertile Crescent a desert, when Marduk killed Inanna, whose name in Vedic was Kali, Ningish Zitta, whose name in Egyptian was Thoth, fled to the lands we call today South America. Session 3b The Zibal Bay and Kukulkan in Mayan myth prehistory to 4,113 years ago. While the Anunnaki at Ein Gazal and Asikli Hayuk instructed the new species of Homo sapiens in the Neolithic technologies and arts, the Nazca lines were being arranged across the deserts of Peru. While the Nephilim giants walked the earth in Jericho and Ketal Hayuk, the icons of South America were elongating their skulls. While the early empires of Egypt, Sumer, and the Veda flourished in Africa, the Middle East, and Southern Asia, the earliest temple construct was built at Tiwanaku as a shrine to a foreign god whom the indigenous tribes called Viracocha. Here we see his round, decorative crown and shaved chin as Viracocha stands in a supplicant position outside the entrance to the Tiwanaku Shrine. Compare this to the contemporary statue of Judea from Lagash with his round, beaded crown, his beardless chin, and his hands clasped in supplication. Only one side of the gateway of Viracocha, standing behind his stele, beyond the entrance to Tiwanaku, is carved with decorative complex hieroglyphics. The top and center carved figure on the gateway of Viracocha represents the same god as the stele's depiction, however is here shown wearing the mask of a feathered serpent. The feathered serpent motif came to symbolize the height of all the subsequent Mesoamerican civilizations to follow, from the Incans of Bolivia to the Toltecs of northern Mexico. It was juxtaposed to the specter of death, depicted as a skull, that symbolized the waning counterpart to the rising feathered serpent. And, just as the longer-skulled Mayans replaced the rounder-skulled Olmecs, 
so too would the Toltec king Kukul Khan assume the ultimate throne of the feathered serpent over the mysterious Mayan pantheon of the Zibal Bay. Although at their height the Mayan and Aztec empires both possessed millions of colorful codices in their native hieroglyphic script, when the Jesuit conquistadors landed from 1492, they began a vicious campaign of burning all these historical and mythological records. All that yet remains are a small handful of codices in the Spanish translation of the oral traditional Popol Vuh, the Mesoamerican equivalent of the Sumerian Book of Enki, or the modern Bible. The Popol Vuh describes the cosmology of the universe more concisely than the myth of Nibiru, Sumerian for the planet of the crossing. However, the characters of this Balbe, the Mayan pantheon, of the crossroads, are essentially the same in number as their various Sumerian counterparts. The Popol Vuh describes the Zbalbe as living from prior to the end of the third cosmological epoch, the Jaguar Sun, when the animals were created. Following the end of that epoch, at the beginning of the Wind Sun, the Mud People were formed. At the end of the Wind Sun, there was an apocalypse, and all the Mud People were destroyed at the start of the Sun of Fire Rain and replaced by the Wood Monkeys. The Wood Monkeys were, in turn, destroyed in the apocalypse at the end of the Fire Rain Sun by a flood marking the start of the Water Sun. This marked the creation of our modern incarnation, the Corn People. Following this, the Popol Vuh describes the Olmec, Dark Jaguar, the Mayan, Jaguar Kitze, the Aztec Mixtec, Jaguar Knight, and the Toltec, called Not Right Now in the Popol Vuh, as the four great houses of the pre-Columbian Mesoamerican empires. The Zibalbe, or the Lords of the Underworld, lived during the epoch of the animals, called in the Popol Vuh the Jaguar Sun. Following the apocalypse that ended that epoch, the Zibalbe ascended and took on cosmic scale, representing South Hemisphere constellations and the local planets of the solar system. In this diagram of a circle divided into 12 sections, and crossed in the middle by six horizontal and one vertical bars between the twelve divisions, we see the rulers of the Mayan pantheon compared with the epochs, or suns, of the Popol Vuh. Session 3C The Sumerian and Mayan Pantheons A Comparative Study Having now traced their impact on the earliest cultures to evolve there, by examining and comparing their ruins and artifacts, we can now see both sides of the Atlantic Ocean's respective earliest pantheon's family trees, accent their contemporary development, compare and contrast their similarities and differences. In this section, we will be examining and comparing the mythological pantheons of two separate, and presumably until now, alien to one another, ancient cultures. We shall be seeing how they relate both in terms of the time they occur and the essential natures of the characters as well. From prehistory, the Sumerian Book of Enki recorded the reign of nine planets prior to the establishment of monarchy on Nibiru. The first and last kings of Nibiru are included as Antu, and Anu. Then begin the reigns of those Nephilim half-breeds listed in the Babylonian king's list. They reign from the locations we today call India, Iraq, and Egypt over the earliest empires of the Fertile Crescent, beginning from some 16,000 years ago, according to the text. Contemporary to the reign of nine planets and the ten monarchs of Nibiru, Planet X, 
The Popol Vuh records the origin of the twelve and seven Zibalbe during the epoch of animals in the era of the jaguar sun. The complex Mayan calendar system of measuring these epochs by years establishes the jaguar sun of the animals began 20,492 years ago and ended around the same time as the Sumerian Book of Enki describes the Anunnaki as having descended to the lands of the Fertile Crescent. 13,366 years ago, the Jaguar Sun ended, and contemporary to the reign of the Nephilim half-breeds in Mesopotamia was the era of the Mud People under the Wind Sun, according to the Popol Vuh. Just as the earliest settlements of South America revolve around Nazca, Ica, and Tiwanaku, Peru, the Mud People were the early Incans of the Altiplano and pre-Machu Picchu, Bolivia. Then, between around 12,000 and exactly 10,240 years ago, a third apocalypse happened ending the reign of the half-breed Anunnaki Nephilim in the Levant and the mud people of the Wind Sun in South America. The Fire Rain Sun era of the Wood Monkeys is recorded in the Popol Vuh as beginning around the same time as the final seven generations of terrestrial Nephilim giants before the Deluge. At this time in South America, the Incan Empire reigned, and in Mesoamerica, the Olmec civilization began. In this era, we find the generations of Cain listed in the modern biblical book of Genesis and the construction of the Great Pyramids at Giza. Then, it is written, the flood swept over. During the rule of the four great houses during the Water Sun Epoch, of the corn people in the Popol Vuh, the Maya, Aztec, Mixtec, and Toltec empires reigned in Mesoamerica, while in the Levant during that time we find the seven times seven generations following Noah as described in the books of the Bible from Exodus through the surahs of Quran. Around 2,000 years ago, scriptures stopped being added to the Latin Vulgate, upon which our modern Bible is based, and some 1,560 years later, the historical record of the Popol Vuh ends with the Spanish conquests. Next, we will look again at the circular diagram with seven inner bars. First, we see the twelve Anunnaki constellations, based on their names for the planets including Nibiru, the Moon, and the Sun, divided in the middle by the seven Nephilim Anunnaki, descendants of Nibiruan King Anu, to reign on Earth before the Flood. Next, we see the Mayan equivalent of this same diagram, with the seven Zibalba Bay houses across the twelve Zibalba lords of the underworld. Now, in this third, similar-shaped diagram, we see both the Sumerian and Mayan names of the twelve and seven traits listed together. Also, the labels of which of the seven planets or twelve signs of the zodiac each character portrays are added. In this last diagram, we see listed all the historical names and traits attributed to the pantheon of twelve and crossbreeding of seven. From the beginning in the outermost circle, we list the twelve royal Anunnaki, followed next one in with the twelve Gnostic archons, followed next in by the twelve tribes of Israel, next by the twelve apostles, and last by the twelve Zibalbe. The central bars are labeled with the names of seven terrestrial Anunnaki, seven Gnostic powers, seven terrestrial Nephilim, the seven original churches of Christianity, and the seven Zabalba Bay, 
Houses of the Damned. Combining the five attributes of twelve traits and the five attributes of seven traits with one more of each, we describe a full calendar round's worth of the dominions over the earth. Session 4A Nibiru Tiamat Sumerian Myth to return to an examination of the symbolism of the Sumerian concept of Satan, i.e. ultimate evil, diametrically opposed to Marduk, who was held as the champion of ultimate good, according to the Sumerian Bible, the Book of Enki, Tiamat represented the prototypical planet Earth. Insofar as Marduk symbolized the alien planet Nibiru, the tale of the war in the heavens between Nibiru and Tiamat described, as detailed in the Book of Enki, a collision between the alien planet and our own Earth. According to the extensively descriptive account in the Sumerian Bible, Nibiru, Marduk, entered from deep space into our solar system in an opposite direction from that taken by the planetary revolutions in their orbits. This led to a head-on collision between Nibiru and Tiamat, which broke Tiamat into three pieces. One became the asteroid belt, one became our current planetary mass, and the third became Earth's moon. Supposedly, it is from Nibiru, the denizen of the deep, whose name means in Sumerian, Planet of the Crossing, that the Anunnaki alien EBEs originate. Thus, while life was forming on Earth and evolving for several million years following this catastrophic impact, Nibiru was, ostensibly, wandering in space. It also bore forth life, however, in its supposedly highly volcanic atmosphere, the cold-blooded reptilian sort of species evolved to achieve space-age sentience before Homo sapiens had walked the surface of the Earth. These reptilian aliens, then, according to Sumerian legend, came to Earth and cultivated the Homo sapiens species into a mold of their own form of civilization, instituting themselves as gods over men. Again, according to the legends from the Book of Enki, the close passage of Nibiru to Earth some 8,000 years ago resulted in the deluge that swept over pre-Sumerian Mesopotamia. The legends of this event are also related in the Sumero-Akkadian Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh. The flood tablet from this work describes the Anunnaki cowering over their inability to prevent the deluge and save humanity. In this legend, the only god who does not lament the fate of those who drowned was Enlil, with whom it is written that Utnapishtim, the Babylonian name of the biblical Noah, made the rainbow covenant that God should never destroy mankind by water anymore. So it is written in the Babylonian king's list, where Noah's name is Zayasudra, when the reign of the Nephilim ended, then the flood swept over. Session 4b The Fifth Sun The Mayan Calendar the complex system of cogs and gears that comprises the Mayan calendar measures days of a 13-span week, a 20-span month, and a 365-span year. It does this in such a way that the same number of day and week, month, and year will only line up once every 52 years what the pre-conquest Mesoamericans called an Aztec century. To calibrate such a calendar, however, requires one to fix a start date, such that on any one specific given date, all the days of the week, the month, 
and year glyphs would align in a starting position. Modern Mayanologists call this system the long count, but it is called in Mayan the Tzolkin, or in Aztec Nohotl, the Tonalamal. Counting upward by Aztec centuries, we find that one Aztec century is equal to one Tzolkin, which in turn is equal to 18,980 kin days, or 13 katan, or 18-month lunar years of 20-day weenals, months. If one takes as one start date August 11th, negative 3114 year Pythagoras, then the current Sulkin will end on midnight December 20th, positive 2012 year Pythagoras. It is calculated, according to the Mayan calendar, that each epoch, or sun, described in the Popol Vuh lasts one Sulkin, or 13 Ketan. Thus, the date, negative 3114 year Pythagoras, corresponds in the Mayan cosmological narrative to the world flood that destroyed the wooden monkeys and gave birth to the modern corn people. Likewise, the date, positive 2012 year Pythagoras, will mark the end of the corn people's water sun and usher in the fifth sun, on December 21st. So let us look at the celestial events that will occur in 2012 to determine if they may also have occurred in a similar conjunction in negative 3114 year Pythagoras. In 2012 we can accurately predict two events of interplanetary and cosmic significance occurring in the heavens above our heads. The first involves the alignment of the Sun, the Earth, and the core of the Milky Way galaxy. Over the millennia, the orbital plane of the planets around the Sun wobbles around like a loose record. On the very day of the 21st of December, positive 2012, the Sun will align from the position of Earth in exact front of the Milky Way's core. The Milky Way's core is in the tropic constellation, Sagittarius. It has only been since around positive 1999 that the Hubble Space Telescope has been able to peer deep enough into the core of our own galaxy to confirm the existence there not only of cosmogenesis, the birth of new stars, but the existence of a black hole. The exact effects of this alignment have not yet been seen. However, it seems probable that it will provide a significant opportunity for studying the deepest reaches of the cosmos with Hubble, the International Space Station, and other satellites. However, it can be said with at least absolute certainty that this alignment of the Sun and galactic core will be visible only during the day and due to Earth's 23.5 degree angle of inclination from the planetary orbital plane only from the northern hemisphere. The second event of cosmic significance will be visible exactly 180 degrees opposite from the alignment of the Sun with galactic core. From the southern hemisphere, by night, will approach the asteroid Apophis. Apophis will have just passed Earth's position in its orbit and will be out ahead of Earth leading towards its elliptical orbit carrying it away from our planet until its next approach in 2029 when, by some scientists' calculations, it will catch up with us again and collide with us from behind. On December 21, 2012, Apophis will be exactly 0.1 astronomical unit AU distance from the planet Earth, about 39 times the distance between Earth and our moon. Session 5. 
the lid of Pakel Votan and the Arecibo message and reply. On August 28th, positive 695 here, Pythagoras, Pakel Votan, whose name meant Shield the Great, died and was entombed in the Hall of Inscriptions at Palenque, a Mayan observatory in Mesoamerica. His tomb commemorated his achievement in establishing Palenque, and the lid of his sarcophagus depicts him escaping from a demon below, ascending the world tree at the crossroads towards Quetzalcoatl, Kukulcan, the feathered serpent. On November 16th, positive 1974, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, SETI, group of scientists led by Frank Drake of Cornell University and Carl Sagan, used the Arecibo Radio Telescope to broadcast 1,679 binary digits at 2389 megahertz radio waves modulated with 10 hertz pauses at 10 bits per second for three minutes towards globular cluster M13 about 25,000 light years from Earth. The Arecibo message consisted of 1679 binary units arranged in 73 rows and 23 columns depicting in pixels from top to bottom the numbers 1 through 10, the atomic numbers of the elements hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, the molecular components of DNA, the formulae for sugar and base DNA nucleotides, the number of nucleotides in a DNA genome, and a depiction of its double helix pattern. A proportioned human figure above the third planet from the Sun in the depiction of our solar system below and at the bottom a depiction of the radio dish with a description of its proportions. That this pattern sequence resembles the exact configuration of the lid of the sarcophagus of Pakal Votan from some 1,279 years before the Arecibo message was designed may be a coincidence of intuitive sciences, or it may have been intentional by Drake and Sagan, who designed the pattern sequence. Either way, the more shocking idea would be to consider the Mayans, thousands of years before, had received the message from the nearby antenna's location in the future. However, what is even more shocking than that idea is the fact that there was indeed a reply to the Arecibo message, and it came apparently from extraterrestrial origins. On August 21, positive 2001, year Pythagoras, a crop formation was discovered to have formed overnight in a field next to the Chill Bolton radio telescope the Hampshire, United Kingdom, headquarters of the SETI group of scientists. This crop formation is a repetition with modification of the original Arecibo message, which had been rebroadcast by the private company Cosmic Call for three days in late May, positive 1999, from the Ivpat Oriva radio telescope in the Ukraine towards four stars as near as 60 light years away. In the crop formation reply message, we see several significant differences from the original Arecibo message sent out by SETI. The original message was 1,679 bits, 73 rows by 23 columns while the reply message is 1,302, 74 rows by 23 columns. This appears to be a logical method of encrypting additional information. 
From the top down, we find the same numbers 1 through 10 as the original message. Beneath this is the glyph comprising the chemical elemental numbers for life on Earth, plus additional element, atomic number 14, silicon. The helix depiction of DNA reflects a slight change in the genomic coding sequence, resulting in one strand having three loops for every two loops of the other. The population, height, and depiction of the humanoid species are all altered. The height of the humanoid figure is now about 3 feet 4 inches according to the scale and has a vastly enlarged cranium proportion from the original message's depiction of a six foot tall human being. The solar system in the depiction consists of the three home planets of nine total in the system. The fifth planet out appears to be the planet of origin. At the bottom is a different form of communication apparatus than the original Arecibo antenna dish with the different measurements on the lowest two rows to indicate the communication apparatus's scale. 